All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you enjoy the amazing lunch. Uh, it's a little bit messy, so even our speaker, I have to drag him away from lunch. Sorry, Dan, but you have to give a talk. You, we can put food on the side for you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, there's plenty of space at the front if you don't have space. Uh, for the few of you who don't know me, I'm Pavlos Protovavas. I'm the Scientific Program Director for the Institute for Applied Computational Science. It's over there, we have a banner in case you don't know. And you're here for the seminar series. Um, we have this almost bi-weekly or weekly. Um, the, the talks, as I keep saying, is whatever we think is fun and cool. It uh, covers a lot of topics in computational science and data science. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, next week, we have one of our own faculty here, Sis, Sasha. He will be talking about natural language processing. The followed by Chris Jones from iRobot. Uh, he will be talking about the work they do at iRobot, which is a company very close here. And then uh, heh, someone who's going to be talking about astronomy, that's me, and how we use machine learning. And the end of the semester, we have Bryce Meredith, who is We'll be talking about uh, design of materials in a computational way. So that's about the program. Um, today, I'm, uh, of course, I keep saying that. I'm very pleased to announce Dan. Dan is one of our first friends at the program. We met, I think, a, a month after we launched the master's program. I don't remember how we met, but he's been around for a while. Um, he knows a lot about our program. Um, when I met him, he was the research director at Barry. Barry is the Boston area research initiative. Uh, in a nutshell, what they do is they take all kind of data from the city of Boston, and they do a lot of interesting data analysis. Um, Dan graduated from Ohio, Oberlin College, a very famous liberal art college in Ohio. Is in Ohio, right? Or, yeah. It's right near Cleveland. Uh, <coughs> Then he did his PhD at SUNY, but the flagship of SUNY University, the Binghamton, uh, that's somewhere upstate New York from what you said, yeah, in computational biology. But then he moved into data science, as many of us do, uh, people that they start from somewhere else and then we move to data science. Uh, his uh, research as the talk and the topic is, is about uh, understanding the cities from the data perspective and finding solutions to city problems, urban problems, by looking at the data. Is that a fair? Yeah. Couldn't have said uh, it better. Yeah. And his particular interest is collective functioning of neighborhoods. Uh, today he will be talking about something, apparently he only worked the last six months or something. Somewhere around there. About yeah. division of labor and maintenance of uh, urban commons. Uh, for the master's students, we're interested to take the capstone. Brian is going to be one of the sponsors of one of our projects. Um, we just, uh, we're going to define it a little better and it's going to be on the website. So, Brian, uh, Dan. Thank you, Pavlos. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, glad to see you all. I'm going to move this down a little bit. I feel like I'm a little loud. Um, I've never given a talk after eating barbecue ribs before, so first off, if there's anything in my teeth, please just shout it out, and if I fall asleep in about 10 minutes, you'll know what happened. Um, but so, anyway, as Pablo said, I'm going to talk a bit about division of labor in the maintenance of the urban commons, and I will explain what all those jargony words mean in a moment, but I want to start out by showing you guys a video. Um, so this is, well, actually, the video, this video speaks for itself. No, I think it's fine. <coughs> right, so <clears throat> that particular video, right, it tells you a little bit of a story 
uh, just through data, right? It's, it's this video of, well, tree emergencies, right? You only get so many tree emergencies so often if you're the city of Boston. And then Hurricane Irene hits and bam, there's 1,082 that need to be taken care of in just a few days. And so, I mean, we could think of this in a number of ways. One is simply that this is an artifact, right? It's, it's a digital artifact of that event, right? We can look back and we can see the event and we can see its magnitude kind of captured and archived in this data set. Um, but what I like to think about this is more importantly is the content of that information. And the content of that information is more than the fact that there were 1,082 trees down, right? Every single one of those reports, someone saw a tree and decided to take action on it, right? They cared enough to do something, right? And they took care of this public problem, right? Which is technically everyone's issue, but nobody's responsibility. And so it's this interesting story of how the city of Boston, its residents essentially kind of galvanized themselves to, to take responsibility in the wake of this storm. Um, now I wanna show you just a second video, really quickly. So kind of the same idea, but to bring it just a little bit more mundane, now this is all the calls received by the 311 system in Boston over the course of a year, street light outages, potholes, graffiti removal, there were the tree emergencies embedded in there. Calls for even the mayor's birthday, right? All sorts of things. But, and yes, people do make that call. Um, and, and so what we're seeing here is that, right, the tree emergency story is a really visceral one. It's an easy one uh, to tell a story, a fun story about. But in reality, this is happening every day, right? This is how, if you live in the city of Boston, how things get done. Right? People notice issues, they report them to the government, and then the government sends out the necessary personnel and equipment to take care of it. This is how we take care of the city in the modern day and age, through this 311 system. And now, one of the things I love about this video, and I love to point out to my students, right? you watch it and you're like, wow, that's so cool, look at all that information, it's bouncing up on the screen, 175,000 calls over the course of a year. But then I ask them, well, what did you learn? Right? And really all they've learned is that you can't map anything inside of Franklin Park or inside of the airport. But other than that, it's, it's hard to pull much out of these data on their own. And so what I'm going to tell today is sort of a, a, a fuller narrative of how we learn from the 311 system and related administrative databases. Because they weren't made for research purposes, right? There's a ton of information and content there, but not all that much structure and guidance as to what you can actually learn from it. So the first question is, what does the 311 database actually tell us about how people make these reports? How can we manipulate, organize, splice, and dice this data set to find out the answers to those questions. And the second part is, how can these insights advance both scholarship and policy, right? Once you find information, how do you turn it into something you want to know and something that the city itself needs to know? Right, so just a quick outline. So I'm gonna start out by talking about the Boston 311 project itself, its, its genesis and its basis, um, and kind of contextualize it in my broader research agenda. Um, second, I'm going to talk a bit about custodianship of the urban commons, which is essentially what I just talked about a little bit. And third, I want to talk about this idea that maybe there's a division of labor in that process, that different individuals are fulfilling different roles that come together to take care of the urban commons in some regards. So, for starters, the Boston 311 project, how do, how do we even get here to, to this moment? What? Is there 311 in Boston? They, they changed the name. It was the mayor's hotline for four or five years, and now they finally named it 311. Menino refused to make it 311 because Somerville already had a 311 system, and that would make Boston copying Somerville. Uh, <laughs> welcome to politics. Uh, so the Boston 311 project. Uh, so Pavlos mentioned that I'm the research director for this thing called the Boston Area Research Initiative. Um, and we are an inter-university partnership that pursues and supports original urban research on the cutting edge of both science and policy, and particularly in the age of digital data, right? How do we use these resources to find common interests between researchers, policymakers, and practitioners? Uh, our faculty directors are Robert Sampson and Chris Winship, both professors of sociology here at Harvard, and I'm the research director uh, responsible for most of our kind of strategic uh, and long-term planning. Um, we have faculty representing 12 area universities associated with the program, policymakers and practitioners from over 15 government agencies uh, working with us on various things. And our home is basically at the Radcliffe Institute for uh, Advanced Study, but also we work with Rappaport Institute uh, and the city of Boston closely. Um, 
But I, I bring up Bari because it, the concept behind Bari is sort of central to the concept behind this talk and, and the ideas within it. Right? And it really is based on three simple premises, right? Local policy should be driven by evidence-based decision making. Makes sense, a little, little idealistic, but makes sense in principle. Behavioral science should focus on individuals and the societies they create. And that's actually the definition of the thing. You could probably take should out of that sentence. And those two goals converge in the study of the city, right? Anything the behavioral scientist or the social scientist discovers about the city should, in theory, be relevant to the person who actually has to serve the city and its neighborhoods. And anything that that person working for the city discovers or knows or experiences or any program they're running should, in theory, be relevant to the behavioral scientist. Now, there's a problem here. Traditionally, these groups do not always come together, right? Criminologists and police departments often find ways to work together, but anything beyond that too much, you end up with these great conversations that end with, well, what do we do next, right? And the researcher says, well, I need a graduate student, maybe a postdoc, uh, I need to write a survey. Uh, this is gonna take two and a half years, uh, and I'll get back to you on the answer. And the policymaker says, well, that's great, but I have a Boston Globe headline that came out yesterday that I need to deal with. Um, and things kind of break down eventually. What we've discovered is that big data, uh, and I, I hate that term as much as anybody else, but it's a good catch-all. Big data and really modern administrative data provide a new set of resources that can be the centerpiece of the conversation because the data already exist, right? They're streaming into some server somewhere and they need to be understood and they provide a new opportunity. And so then the conversation ends with, well, give me those 300,000 records and we'll look at it, give me a month, we'll write a memo of a first cut of what's going on here, and then we'll talk again, and we'll ask some more questions. And then we'll go back to the house and, and do some more analyses, and so on and so forth, and it becomes this great iterative process, uh, what one of my colleagues likes to call a virtuous cycle of learning and innovation, right, between the researchers and the policymakers. Um, and so this concept is sort of the basis of the 311 project. In 2008, Boston instated a constituent relationship management system, which is just a complicated way of saying 311. Uh, and it now receives about 500 requests a day. Oh, I should mention this was started by some guys called the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics at the city of Boston. Um, it now receives about 500 requests a day, which is a lot of information uh, and a lot of work orders and such. Um, and so we sat down, and this was in 2011, we sat down and we said, well, how do we leverage these data to inform both public policy and social science, right? Can we leverage our respective interests and the, and the overlap between them to really do something cool and novel with these data? Now, people have tried a number of things. A lot of you have probably seen this. This is from a Wired uh, piece a number of years ago called What Do uh, 100 Million Calls to 311 Tell You About New York? And, they showed us, right, what does a day look like, right, the patterns of calling, and what does the city look like in terms of volumes of calling. Uh, we've done some work here in Boston thinking about, right, different innovations. Uh, if you give people a mobile app, how does that change their likelihood of reporting? Turns out young people, or people in their 20s, are more likely to start reporting. And probably not that mind-blowing of a discovery once we made it. Um, tracking neighborhood conditions, right? These calls are the eyes and ears of the city, right? People are seeing things and calling them in, and so then you can do things like this is a map of deterioration to private spaces. It's a map of where utilities are failing, where buildings are in, in disrepair, and people are taking poor care of their housing. Um, but today I want to talk particularly about what is the basic nature of the decision to report an issue in the public space, right? And and answer the question, could this tell us something about how communities maintain the commons, right? The commons, as I'll talk about in a moment, is a classic question in the social sciences. And does this give us a new window onto that process? Um, but on the flip side, right, from the policy perspective, does it tell us something about how these programs work, right? What the 311 system even is and how it should be best implemented and managed and to be an even better innovation uh, in government policy. So that's really going to be the goal for today. Now, I take the somewhat unorthodox approach. I do my acknowledgments early because I want you to know when I say we who I'm talking about because um, I'm going to use the word we kind of indiscriminately over the next 30 minutes. Uh, so policy collaborators include the Mayor's Office of Newer Mechanics, the Constituent Relationship Management System, and the 301 system. Justin Holmes was one of the original founders. Uh, and then the Department of Innovation Technology is very much involved in this collaboration. Uh, Bill Oates, the former CIO, Yasha Franklin-Hodge, the current CIO, um, and 
Kurt Savoy, who's a data expert there. And then some co-authors I have to give some credit to, uh, who written papers with on this topic. Uh, the video is done by Mauro Martino, um, and some uh, doctoral fellows and other faculty who have uh, been involved in the project. So when I say we, I'm referring to some subset of these names on the screen uh, over the next 30 minutes. These are all the collaborators kind of involved in the uh, inception of the idea and the, the pursuit of the studies I'm going to describe today. All right, so custodianship in the urban commons. Right, so when you think about it, right, all societies have some level of shared space. Right? So this is a residential village uh, from Central Africa. Right? And even there you see, you know, it's not quite urban, but these huts, they have space in between the huts where people are collectively responsible for. And you think about big cities, right? Big cities are this collective product of a society, and a lot of that has public space and infrastructure that has to be taken care of in some regard. And there's this classic question of, well, how do you do that taken care of? Right? In this particular example, right, there's a fire going. Someone's got to be responsible for making sure that fire doesn't burn everything down, right? There's, there's pets and such. You have to keep things relatively clean. Or in Boston, as we all well know, uh, in the winter we see people collaborating, so to speak, often about getting the sidewalks cleaned out, the, the fire hydrants dug out, you know, so on and so forth. And then there's the classic, right, the illustration of the original tragedy of the commons, right? If people allow their sheep to graze for a little bit too long to get a little bit of extra, well, then eventually the thing becomes degraded. So there's this constant tension when we have these shared spaces of, what, of these things that are nobody's responsibility and yet everybody's responsibility in some way. And how do you then create what we would call a sustainable commons? And when we look at urban neighborhoods, right, it's actually pretty mundane, but yet important. Right? People just sweeping things up. Uh, on the side of the street, people curbing their dogs, people shoveling out fire hydrants during a snowstorm, or these examples of people noticing all of these issues, right? These potholes, these broken sidewalks, these streetlight outages, graffiti, and taking responsibility for them just long enough to uh, instigate the process by which they get fixed, right? And all of these things are essential to the well being of living in these neighborhoods. And so I wanted to find the term custodianship. Uh, it, sound, it means what it sounds like, uh, behaviors that serve to maintain public spaces. Right? And I, I want to make the argument that 311 calls are basically an example of this. And therefore, the 311 database, in its kind of intricacy and detail, provides a special window into studying uh, this behavioral pattern. Um, now, to understand any behavior, um, I come from, as, as Pablo said, I, I have a biology background, and that makes me then sort of a psychologist because I'm a biologist who studies human behavior. Um, I, I like to think about things in terms of what motivations they represent. And so I, to understand what custodianship is, right? it's easy enough to give something a name, but you have to understand what it is. I, I make the argument that it's a manifestation of territoriality, right? our, our tendency to claim spaces right? and, and objects and take care of them. Um, and so this is something I, I guess we could call the territoriality thesis, if you will. And it, it's a funny one, right, when you think about it, because we all think about territoriality in terms of, like, this sentinel bird claiming his space, right, on the savanna, or this lion telling this hyena in no uncertain terms, that was my carcass. Uh, and if you have never seen this National Geographic video, it's fantastic. It doesn't end well for the hyena. Um, but then when you translate it, to the urban context, you have guys like Whitey Bulger, right? This is what you think of. You think of gangs. You think of people fighting over turf when you think of the word territoriality. Um, you think of gangs down in Mattapan, you know, marking their space and being clear. And so that's kind of a, you know, one way of thinking about territoriality. But environmental psychologists and really social psychologists in general have realized that there's a lot more to territoriality than just that in human behavior, right? So this is one of my favorite examples, especially because it's perfect in a talk. Now, this isn't a, a weekly class, but some of you are probably sitting in the same seat that you like to sit in during seminars, right? And there's actually some really cool studies that show, like, after the first week of a course, like, seating is basically 95% set for the rest of the semester. Um, and that's a natural form of territoriality, right? You're kind of claiming this is my seat. And you probably get really annoyed if you come in and someone took your seat. Um, or just this, right? That's your cubicle. It belongs to me. This is mine. 
Right? And these are simple manifestations of saying that something belongs to you. And so basically from this literature, the argument has been that territoriality is more than just defense and exclusion. It's basically a suite of cognitions and attitudes and behaviors that arise from a sense of ownership. And their role is to kind of, one of their jobs is to manage social roles regarding objects and spaces. Right? So with this expanded definition of territoriality, uh, it becomes something a little bit more, uh, well, it, it becomes something a little bit more sophisticated. We can think about operating in urban neighborhoods. So there's been some good evidence that people putting, um, putting lots of decorations on their house during holiday, holidays is a manifestation of their territorial motives. Um, needless anecdote of the day, I almost lived in an apartment right there in my first year of graduate school. I'm really, really happy to this day that I did not accept that lease. Um, or this, an example of really having no territorial motives, right? Not caring that much about the space, allowing it to fall into disrepair. These are all manifestations of the presence or absence of territoriality. Um, so then the argument here is that then 311 reports, those that re reference things in the public space really are a manifestation of territoriality, right? They really do um, emerge from this tendency that we all have. Um, and so with that argument, right, if territoriality is based in psychological ownership, then simply put, 311 reports should be anchored by the home and they should be motivated by references to home and, and spaces around it. Um, and so I'm just going to summarize very quickly some work on this before we get into the division of labor aspect because the division of labor aspect depends in part on, on this thesis. So, we took the database, over 500,000 reports with geographical reference. Um, each case includes date and time, address or intersection, standardized case type, and anonymous caller identifier. That anonymous caller identifier is critical in all of this because you can actually measure individual differences in use of the system. Um, so there's about 77 case types that are relevant to the public domain. Uh, and the cases have the anonymous key code. And so we have 131,000 individuals in the data set then who we can compare their, their patterns of reporting across. So the first question is simply, how often do people actually call in these public issues? And what you basically see is 91% of people are below four reports, and this is over a five-year period, right? So this is a rare event, right? People don't do this often. Most people don't. Although you do see people going way out towards the end, and you might ask, who is over there? <laughs> That's Mayor Menino. Uh, he's, Mayor Menino is somewhere out there, uh, um, may he rest in peace, uh, and he used to apparently actually call the hotline sometimes without even a problem, just to test how people would respond to a cranky old Italian man, um, pretending of course, <laughs> pretending to be a cranky old Italian man. Um, but so basically we've got this split in the data, right, you've, you've got a nice elbow test in a sense uh, between these two groups. Um, so, but, now let's look at the geographic range of reporting. So it turns out that where we knew the home address of the reporter, the median distance of a report from a house was seven meters away. 82% <laughs> of individuals did not make any report about an issue that was more than two blocks from their home. 82%, right? So this is normative, right? People are doing this around their house and really nowhere else. This is an overactive reporter. Um, those, those two dots. Right, so then, just to go a step further to test, okay, well, is this because people are just stuck to their phones, right? Doesn't necessarily hold water because cell phones can go with you anywhere, but just in case, right? There was, there's a bit of a quasi-experiment that we could use to test this with Citizens Connect. Citizens Connect is an iPhone app that is a three, it's now been rebranded uh, 311 app. Um, but so you could do this from your mobile phone as an app. You don't have to call, you don't have to talk to anybody. So maybe this would facilitate a greater range. <coughs> Turns out that you do get more usage, um, more people using it more often. So only 75% are less than or equal to three calls plus 91%. Um, you know, estimated calls more. Um, estimated range grew quite a bit to about 300 meters. But remember, 300 meters is still really only three blocks from your apartment. Right, so this is still well within the range. And so basically this map captures, this is a traditional user and this is a Citizens Connect user. Uh, this is the sort of uh, iconic comparison. So essentially giving people mobility 
They used it a little bit, but they didn't move too much further out, right? And then the last one, I'm going to skip over this very quickly because I have way too many slides. Um, but basically, we tested whether if you put a flyer out that said fix Boston versus fix a neighborhood, which one was more effective. It turns out that th this was more effective and this was as good as not even putting a flyer out uh, when we compared to a control neighborhood. Uh, so to summarize, reporting of public issues is anchored by the home. This remains true when using a mobile app. And messaging about neighborhoods is more effective uh, than about the city. So, so we're looking at a behavior that is territoriality, right? And that's going to sort of flavor how we think about a division of labor. Now, the one thing we do see, though, is that there is a vast variation in reporting tendencies. Right? And this is kind of, in some ways, I'm telling you the research story, but in other ways, I'm, I'm telling you the thought process that went through this program, right? And looking at this, I, I asked myself some time ago now, is there a distinction between these two groups that goes beyond just volume, right? Is there actually a different role that each one of these is playing for their neighborhood, right? Doesn't neighborhood need the people on this side of the line and the people on this side of the line to be um, effective in the maintenance of the commons? We have these typical custodians, one to two reports of public issues a year, right? This is basically your 90 percenters. And then we have these exemplar custodians, right? Three plus reports of public issues a year. This is your 10%, right? This very special group that's actually moving around and, and reporting more things. And then there's another point, which I'll get to in a little bit. City employees are playing a role here, right? They are walking around neighborhoods, and they are, it is their job to notice and take care of those issues that they see. Um, so then the question that I want to continue with is, is and this is really the meat of today's talk, uh, is there a division of labor? And if so, how do we tease it out? Right? And, and I thought this would be a good topic for, for this particular seminar because in a way, this is really a challenge of data science in the sense that it's, it's, a, it's a creative challenge to try to figure out how do you get at this, this hypothesis right? that's there, but the data needs to be reorganized and, and queried in particular ways in order to get there. So let's define what a division of labor is. Members of a group specializing in different tasks contributing to collective goals. Right? And what's particularly important about that is that the groups are non-substitutable. Right? One group is doing something more effectively than the other group is doing, and vice versa. And so the first study I'm going to present in, in depth is to ask the question, are typical and exemplar custodians both required for the maintenance of the commons? Right? If we could say that typical, like three or four typicals could cover what one exemplar does and you have a clean substitution there, that's not a division of labor. That's just volume, right? volume of activity. What we need to demonstrate is that both of those groups are necessary for this to work. Study number two goes a little bit further. So I'm essentially telling you the answer to study number one right now. Um, study number two goes a little bit further and asks, do typical and exemplar custodians and city employees actually fulfill different roles? Right? Can we identify the different tasks that each one of those specializes in along the way to demonstrate how this division of labor actually works. All right, so behavioral composition and the neighborhood maintenance. So the first thing we needed was an objective measurement of maintenance. Could we actually kind of find or create situations that people had to respond to, and then you can evaluate whether each neighborhood is effective or not? So I still don't know how I pulled this off, but I convinced nine undergraduate students at UMass Boston to uh, be uh, research assistants for a summer, and the job was to go find streetlight outages across the city, which means we walked through about half the neighborhoods of the city in the dark um, because the streetlights have to be on. This got very awkward at times, trust me. Um, although one of the big lessons that comes out of this is when you are the only white person in the like three mile radius and you're holding a clipboard, people think you're a cop. Um, it's, it's very strange. I was asked multiple times if I was a police officer. Um, public works at the same time was assessing quality of all sidewalks. And issues were cross-referenced with 311 reports to assess effectiveness in maintenance across neighborhoods. Right? So basically, you go back to the data set and you can figure out, okay, I saw a street light outage on August 15th. How long did it take for that street light outage to be reported? Um, and the same thing with the sidewalks. 
Right. And then what we did was we measured the distribution of custodians across neighborhoods. So based on home addresses, so some of those reported the 311 system. And for those who were missing home addresses, we imputed census tract based on where people made the most reports. It said 89% accuracy when you aggregate up to the track level, the R was 0.97. Were you actually making 311 reports yourself or just taking an inventory of the out, out No, we were, we were taking an inventory of outages and issues and then going back to the system and finding out when the issues we noted were reported. Yeah, in fact, there was, there was a street light out in front of my house for the entirety of this study and I refused to report it because I couldn't, I couldn't be a participant in my own data set. Um, I'd be messing with the, the study in some sense. Um, and I, I can get into more detail if people want to know this validation process, but basically it turns out that this imputation works relatively well. Um, and all these measures are from 2011. So the first thing is to think about, okay, distribution of these individuals and how do you want to really operationalize it. Right, so what we discovered was really it was important not just number of typical custodians, nor even typical custodians per capita, but cur typical custodians per mile squared, right? Because you think about coverage. You know, how many individuals do you have covering this space? Um, and then exemplars, they're a little bit more mobile, right? They cover the entire space, so it turns out that the best way to measure them is to have them be just counted, right? And not, not per capita, not per space, just counted. So these are the two main measures for this study. Um, and then what we did was, we basically tried to see which of these two things, if either or both, predict the efficacy of reporting broken sidewalks. Turns out, they both predict it independently, and critically, when you put an interaction effect in, the interaction effect is positive and significant, which means, and I'll show this in a graph in a moment, typicals and exemplars were both necessary. Right? They, they both, their combination was the most effective way to um, be uh, successful or efficacious in reporting sidewalk reports. Streetlight outages, same exact analysis. Both significant predictors, and then because there's a smaller N here, and I can get into that later if people are interested, um, because of where the street light edges were, but the interaction effect was actually the strongest predictor. So again, it was the combination of exemplars and typicals that made for the most, um, the most effective uh, process of reporting street light edges. Now all of this, I, if people want to know about how these models were constructed and such, I'm happy to talk about that later. And these all were controlled for a variety of demographic factors and, and such that I'm, I'm not going into here. Um, so basically, what do we find? We find that behavioral heterogeneity and custodianship is actually critical to neighborhood maintenance, right? You need both. And here's graphs of both of those findings. And basically, the stars are most efficacious and the circles are least efficacious. And you'll notice that over at the corners, is where they cluster. And in fact, actually, it seems that until you get to a certain point of both typical and exemplars, you're in the bottom tier of reporting efficacy. Right? So, so we're really seeing the interaction splayed out for us here. OK, so we, we have a hint of a division of labor here. We have a hint of that maybe you know these two groups, or actually likely these two groups are both necessary, but the question is, how are they both necessary, right? What are they doing differently from each other? And what it comes down to is this is a map of South Boston, right? There is heterogeneity not only in the behavior, but there's heterogeneity in the urban landscape, right? The urban landscape is a pretty varied place. So what you're seeing on this map is all the roads based on their zoning. So green roads are residential. Uh, red roads are main streets or commercial streets. Yellow roads are industrial. Right, so there are these different spaces interspersed throughout the urban landscape. And I mean, think about it for yourself, right? When you walk around and you see these spaces, you think about them differently. You interact with them differently. Um, and so the idea was that maybe these two groups are approaching these different types of spaces in their own way, and that was leading to a differentiation in how the commons was being taken care of. Right? So then there's, there's two questions if we really want to get into uh, what a division of labor is and how it works. And these are borrowed from the literature on eusocial insects and the study of division of labor there. Um, but A, what are the origins of behavioral differences? And B, what are these behavioral how are these behavioral differences manifest across different contexts and tasks? 
Right, this is kind of the definition of a division of labor. Where do, where do differences come from and how do they work, essentially? So what would the hypotheses be? Right? Typical exemplar custodians differ in their level of territoriality. Right? That's the main uh, hypothesis here, that they have different strengths of territorial motives. Now, when you have a greater level of territoriality for your neighborhood, one would think that it would expand outwards in some sense. And so, oh, sorry, city employees are operating in their professional capacity. We'll get back to them. Uh, that's a little bit harder to test, but they, they become important as well. Um, but now, with greater territoriality, exemplars will be more likely to extend further into shared spaces. Right? And the idea being that typical custodians with lower levels of territoriality, they're really just concerned with their house and what's around it. But those exemplars, they're seeing the whole space as belonging to them in some sense. Not in an exclusionary way, but in a responsibility and caring sort of way. They're, they're looking at the main street in a way that a typical custodian is not. And then city employees will be most active in institutional spaces, right? We'll see them reporting primarily around schools and industry areas where the rest of the population doesn't really see themselves as having a role. Um, and constituents in general, and exemplars particularly, will be more likely to want to enforce social control, right? And therefore report incivility. So this is an interesting distinction and one that I haven't brought up yet. But some of these reports are for things that just happen, right? Street lights go out, it happens. Potholes, right? Snow melts in the spring, you get a pothole eventually, right? That happens. What doesn't just happen is graffiti, right? What doesn't just happen is illegal dumping, right? Those are things that other people have done. Uh, and there's a, different, there's a different thing going on there, right? A different process. And so the hypothesis was that this is way more important probably to people who live there than to city employees. Um, and furthermore, it's probably way more important to these people who are exemplars who see the whole neighborhood as being under their purview, as opposed to those who have limited their interests to what's right around their house. Right? And so, so those are the hypotheses going in here. Right? So we have the database, again, from March 2010 through March 2015. Uh, there were 439,000 or so reports with geographical information that reference issues in the public domain. Uh, and this time around, uh, the database is a little expanded this time, um, 152,648 reports made by 63,000 individuals. Um, and then we have 64,000 reports by city employees to compare. Um, and 21 of the 77 public case types that I mentioned earlier were now broken out as referencing incivilities in the public space. So graffiti, illegal dumping, et cetera. All right. And then just to be clear about how I'm categorizing things, uh, because it's a five-year data set, I had to do some redefining of what typicals and exemplars were. But Basically, typicals were less than or equal to four, ports, four, four reports, and exemplars greater than or equal to uh, four reports. Um, and city employee was identified by mechanism of reporting. Um, so certain reports come in with a mark on them that say it was made by a city employee. Um, and then we map these to their road, their road segments. So 24,000 road segments in the city. Um, and these are categorized versus, as main versus non-main. We used Boston tax assessors data to categorize them by their their primary zoning. Right, now, one step further, right, I said that we think that they, the typicals and exemplars differ in the amount of territoriality uh, that they have. Now, how do you know that? Right? Well, you have to ask them. So we actually did a survey. So we, we contacted all the people who made at least one report in 2012. We had 682 um, respond to a survey. And what was really cool about this survey was that the survey, since it had the email address of the person who was in the system, we could then take the survey responses and link it to objective behaviors, right? So everything someone had done in the system was now linked to their subjective, right, self-report survey responses that told, told you about themselves. Um, what's also cool about this is that we included people who had never made a public issue report before, so they wanted to get their TV thrown out. That's not a public issue, that's a private issue. Um, in fact, I'm in the database as one of those people who has only once called the system and I needed to throw out a TV, right? So I'm not a custodian, I'm a non-custodian. Um, and so it's possible to compare the custodians to non-custodians to get a fair comparison uh, without getting into certain confounding factors. And again, I can talk about that a little bit later. Um, and we assess two territorial motives for reporting. All right, one is benefiting the community. So things like, why do I do this? Because it improves my community. 
And the other one was enforcing social norms, right? Because it will make the neighborhood safer, because people around here just don't do the right thing sometimes, sorts of questions. So origins of behavioral differences. So this first question, did they actually differ, the two groups, in their territoriality? Turns out they did, and the difference was quantitative, not qualitative, meaning there was sort of a line from non-custodians to typical custodians to exemplar custodians in terms of the desire to benefit the community, right, moving up. So we see sort of this, this gradient moving uphill. Um, and it suggests a single origin um, of the territorial motives uh, with different levels of underlying behavioral patterns. But so the first hypothesis was supported here, right? There's more territoriality being seen in those who are more active. Um, so now let's get to the actual numbers. Right, so, so it turns out that typical and exemplars make almost the same number of reports total um, and city makes about 30% of reports. But now let's break this down by the various contexts, right? So if we look at non-main versus main, so typical reporters are up to 39% as opposed to 35, and exemplars are reporting 42% of the issues on main streets, right? So way more active there in these shared spaces. Now if we look at the different zoning contexts, right? Typicals are way higher or reasonably higher in residential spaces, while exemplars are remarkably more active than typicals in all of the non-residential spaces, right? Responsible for as much as 47% of all reports on regions that are not zoned. Um, and we see city employees actually leading in certain areas as well, industrial and um, in spaces, as I suggested, that are exempt or government zoned in some way. Uh, and then finally, in civilities, we see this remarkable shift from 35% to 50% for exemplars. So taking care of a, a completely you know, disproportionate amount of the incivilities. And the city employees are reporting almost half, the, half of what you would expect them to based on uh, you know, evenness across these categories. So we're seeing support for all the hypotheses here. Essentially, exemplars are more active in shared spaces, and both exemplars and typicals are more active than city employees in uh, dealing with personal offenses, right? Norm violations, incivilities in the public space. Um, so uh, I confirmed uh, the descriptive patterns with some three-level, multi-level models. Uh, we did two models, exemplars versus typical custodians, and then constituent versus city employee. Uh, we incorporated report level characteristics of all sorts just to control weekend versus weekday, season, snow removal, etc. cetera. Um, street level characteristics controlled for a number of things in addition to the hypotheses. Neighborhood level characteristics of various sorts, uh, population density in particular, and also what the predominant use was just to kind of have a comprehensive model here. The results were exactly the same, which typically is what turns out to happen when you have 150,000 data points in a model. Uh, the descriptives often are very similar to the uh, the robust model. Um, but so everything was confirmed, right? The issues on main and non residential streets were more often reported by exemplars. Issues on non residential streets, particularly industrial and exempt, were more often reported by city employees. And the incivilities were more often reported by constituents, particularly exemplars. And a couple other things popped up. Exemplars did more of the reporting in neighborhoods with institutional uses, so places like colleges uh, and the airport and things of that nature, um, and higher population density. And city employees did less of the reporting in neighborhoods in the downtown and with higher population density. And I haven't entirely figured out why that's the case. Uh, that one's a little odd. Uh, I wonder if it's just that there's more activity there and so the city employees don't um, take as much uh, initiative. Um, so, okay. Uh, so basically, territoriality differentiates typical and exemplar custodians. Typical custodians focus on regions abutting homes and exemplars cover shared spaces. So this is great. These are the two pieces of a division of labor. But I want to kind of finish this story up here. I, I feel it needs to be a little bit more complete. And the question is, how do these two facts fit together, right? Is one causing the other? Are they just associated in the same space, right? How do we get from A to B? So in order to test that, we did a set of regressions. Uh, we used the survey sample again um, and asked the question of, right, did someone, if someone reported on a main street, on a non-residential street, or referenced a man-made incivility, can we explain that, right, with their demographics, with the two aspects of territoriality, or with just whether they were an exemplar or not? 
Right. And now if it's just that they're an exemplar and they just happen to, well then okay, so they were more active, they just ended up doing those other things, right? Being on a main street, reporting in, in civility. And so it turns out that being an exemplar, just being classified as an exemplar, completely explained whether an individual um, made a report on a main or non-residential street. So this suggests that, so the original thesis that territoriality was creating this sort of desire to take care of the shared spaces, doesn't hold. It's actually that territoriality just makes you more active and more caring about these sorts of things and that that might lead you to, by happenstance, go into more spaces and do things more often. So it's not actually that territoriality causes the behavior, it's territoriality caused greater activity and greater activity just sort of probabilistically ends up with these differences. Um, but now, a desire to enforce social norms, on the other hand, additionally explained reporting any man-made Incivility. So this was kind of cool. So this one is actually seeming to be a direct effect. So something about wanting to enforce social norms, in fact, does lead you to, it seems a little tautological when I say it this way, it does, in fact, lead you to actively enforce social norms. Um, what's nice about this, at least, is that it's subjective and objective data compare, uh, combined. So these people are really telling us what they care about and they're, they're putting their money where their mouth is. They're actually doing what they care about. Okay, so I wanna wrap up with one last idea and it comes back to this concept that, all right, so we have a division of labor in the maintenance of the urban commons, right? There, we've, we've basically laid out the story here. Here are all the pieces and they're working together. But you know, models are good for certain things, right? And if we go back to the urban common or the commons model, uh, the classic commons model is really just a story of cooperators and non-cooperators, right? People who take care of the commons and people who don't, and then the question of whether these people undermine the system enough that it falls apart. And that's sort of the tragedy of the commons that's always been the, the story. But it's simplistic, right? There's no division of labor there. There's no multiple actors. There's just doers and non-doers. And so the question here is, does this actually help us to understand the commons, right? Is this model necessary? Or can we get away with a cooperator, non-cooperator sort of approximation uh, if, as we move forward? Um, so what I did was I, I looked at the um, distribution of all the roads in the city and a couple other things. And based on the models that I described earlier, uh, I, I figured out where there was need for each of these groups across the city because areas that have more streets or more main streets or more industrial streets are going to have a different need based on these models in terms of typical verse exemplars. Um, and so taking that need then actually laid it against the distribution of these custodians across the city so we could actually figure out, right, so this is for typicals and this is for exemplars. Right. Further above the line, you have more typicals than are needed, quote unquote, and below the line, you have fewer typicals than are needed, and same thing over here for exemplars. And so we see there's not a perfect match, right? This isn't this isn't map matching one to one. Can you explain what you see here? Sure, sure. So in the x-axis, you have the need for exemplars or typical custodians uh, as drawn from these maps, and then. The y-axis is how many people of that type actually live there. All right. And so what you're basically seeing here is if you're, if you're along the line, you kind of have a perfect correspondence between the number of individuals of a certain type and the need for them in the neighborhood. If you're above the line, you have more than you actually need. And if you're below the line, you're lagging in some way. So the, the jobs that one would expect an exemplar to fulfill, under this line, you, you'd think that they'd go a little bit longer before they get taken care of, or they're less likely to get taken care of. Same thing for this graph of the typicals over here. Right, so this creates a different assessment of sustainability than just cooperators, free riders, right? It's asking the question, what needs to get done? And are the people that we need to accomplish that here? Do we have that personnel, so to speak? Is the line the slope one or not? No, the line's the regression. Uh, so why do you say above you need your... Because this is, these are residual. Basically, above is a positive residual and below is a negative residual. But that doesn't mean it's the all... It doesn't mean that's the right thing. It doesn't mean that if you're above, you just, it's just the regression of the two. That's, that's a fair point. So this is, this is based on the assumption that based on the assumption that the, the data themselves describe 
some level of consistency uh, or some universal kind of correspondence between these across the city. Um, it very well may be that the line itself should be a little bit higher, a little bit lower. This is based on sort of the assumption of the global data. Can I ask a technical question? Yeah. Is the regression done in the log space or in the linear space? The regression was done with both variables log transformed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. We can, we, we can debate. Um, all right. So then the question is, right, how well does this measure, right, of, of accomplishment of need, distance from this line, how well is that approximated by just asking the question, what is the percentage of people here that are custodians? All right. So on the bottom, on the x-axis, we see proportion custodian, and on the y-axis, we see exemplars relative to need. And basically, they share 35% of the variation. It's an OK approximation. Right? It's not a great approximation. Right? So then basically, what this is saying is the, the very simple cooperator, non-cooperator uh, model does not really capture the situation here. Right? There, there's a lot of variance being lost when you make that simplification. Um, and so then just to kind of wrap up the evaluation of that, do they tell a different story? Because that's what really matters. right? Do we come away with a different understanding of the commons if we use one assumption versus the other? So did a number of uh, regressions using demographics. And when you use the traditional cooperator model, basically what you find out or what you come away with is a per capita model, right? Home ownership is the most important thing to taking care of the commons. But now that forgets the fact that homeowners live typically in more open neighborhoods with a lot more space. And so you actually need more of them to take care of that space. Right? So when you actually control for all the division of labor things, it turns out that population density is the most important factor in promoting care of the commons because you just have more people. Right? And where there are more people, someone is more likely or someone is likely to make a report. And so it's this interesting distinction where the, mo the simple behavioral model that doesn't take into account both the, the needs of a community and the personnel or the, the behavioral composition of the community um, loses quite a bit of nuance and gets the story wrong. So conclusions, just to wrap up. All right, so the first thing and, and the most important thing here is we, we come away with a more nuanced understanding of the model of the commons, right, and of the problem of the commons, and a way to maybe approach this both empirically and theoretically um, in the future. Right? Basically, we have this model where you've got two actors instead of one leading to maintenance. Right? We've also got a new perspective on urban maintenance in general. Right? Th this has actually been a really interesting question throughout urban sociology for the last 150 years. Right? How do you get from social and demographic context to blight right? and, and collapsing neighborhoods? And now we actually have two types of actors intervening. And so you can start to ask more sophisticated questions of how do you get from point A to point B that go through a behavioral model as opposed to certain assumptions about you know, income predicts the following. Um, relatedly, there's also new pathways for public outreach. Traditionally, the way a 311 system or related does outreach is let's get as many people to participate as possible. But this actually gives the idea that maybe there are different types of participants that you want to be engaging and get them all involved. Um, there's also a bit, of, a, a bit of a hint here of the value of marrying big and small data. Right? We, we had a survey in here that gave us actual ground understanding of what people were thinking about, what people, why people were doing what they were doing. And that's something that isn't happening as, as much in the field yet, and I think is really kind of the next wave where the big data start to become combined more often with traditional methodologies to get a more thorough understanding of what's going on. Second to last, a lot of you have probably read Chris Anderson's uh, essay from a few years ago about the end of theory, right? The data will speak for themselves. They will tell us all the answers. I imagine I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but I just want to comment on how this whole thing couldn't have been done by just throwing the data into some uh, you know, analysis program and having it spit out the answer, so to speak. It took theoretical questions that really reorganized and reconsidered what the content of the data were, isolated what was needed, threw out what wasn't necessary, so on and so forth. Theory was essential to this entire process, and we wouldn't have learned any of these things here if we didn't take theory into consideration as we allowed the data to speak, which I think is really critical um, in kind of the, the world of data science right now. And then finally, 
uh, I feel like this really captured sort of the synergies possible for research policy collaboration, right? We start with the data set and we ask these questions that matter to the city but also matter from a scholarly perspective of how does a commons work and how, how, did, how did this operate? So it, there's been this really exciting sort of back and forth process where it's contributing to understanding but also contributing to service and, and to communities and, and I think that's really valuable and important um, and, and has a bit of promise in it moving forward. So with that said, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. So we have uh, time for one. Um, so I was just wondering, like, what what can the city do with this like research? Like, it has it done anything? Um, hmm. uh, I mean, maybe not Boston, but any city. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the earlier stuff. So actually, the flyers that I showed that was done with the city. All right. So so that was a sort of a first attempt. That was almost you consider it a, a policy experiment of sorts. We we came up with two ways to message the system and we actually did an experiment and tested it. So they're excited about this information as helping them to think about what their constituency is and how it works. Now, I mean, most of these findings here are relatively recent, as Pablo said, the last couple months, so we haven't developed them into, a, uh, into other policy experiments. But I could imagine, right, if you look at the map of the city and you say, well, this neighborhood is lagging in certain ways, you know, but it's particularly because there's no exemplars there. Well, then how do you galvanize that sort of energy in that neighborhood? And, and that's, that's a practical question that I don't necessarily have the answer to yet, but would be a, a great brainstorming session. First, vice versa, right? Well, this area has a bunch of exemplars, but the, the, the everyday people just aren't reporting. How do you get their attention? And so it gives us a more nuanced way of thinking about these things. So the, the city has been closely involved in, in all these conversations, and you know, we're, we're, we're getting to the point where we can translate these particular findings into something practical. I have a hard time believing that an incivility that took place on a residence wouldn't be highly reported. Is it possible that why uh, exemplars are more reporting on incivilities is because they mostly take place in shared spaces? You mean shared spaces like, you mean uh, commercial areas and stuff like Which that? Which is what they do mostly, what they do more of, right? I'm just trying to, I can't tell me if something, dump, somebody dumps something in my yard, I'm sure I'd report it. I mean, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's hard to believe that it would take an exemplar to come by a residence. That's an interesting question. I mean, there are a lot of, that, what's an interesting point there is there's shared spaces as defined here and there's shared spaces more generally. You know, there are, um, it's a number of different answers to that question. So one is the idea that right there, there are lots on streets that are pseudo shared. So maybe you're right in the sense that that does require an exemplar to come, come along. It's not a resident, it's not a non-residential street. It doesn't become a main street, but it's a spot that is pseudo public. Um, now some of these though that are getting reported are not, right, so it's like someone calling in somebody else for an illegal rooming house or calling in somebody else for uh, parking illegally on front and backyards. So things that technically you're within your own space but you're breaking the law and in such a way that it's violating other people's concept of the neighborhood uh, and so, or concept of propriety for that matter. So those are also being more often reported by exemplars than typicals. So, so I do think there's, there's a little bit more going on. But you, you do have an interesting point, right? Like graffiti, uh, graffiti is often occurring in shared spaces. You're, you're correct. So I take the last question. So, okay. so following what Avery asked you, um, so what you said at the end is that this will help the cities if you, if you group people into two exemplars and typicals. Have you done any way studies to see if you increase now typical exemplars and superheroes? You know, something, <laughs> a third kind, does it change? Does it, is it two? Do you have any proof that two is a good example, or three, or one? Uh, do you have any way to measure this? Um, the only thing I remember from your children is a couple of things that is significant, but yet not so significant difference. So I. I, I get your point. Um, in some ways, what we have here is a division of labor that's naturally occurring, right? So I, I haven't made any comments yet about if you could impart or create some another form. Practically speaking, I don't think that would be a good idea um, to try to 
I, I don't think going for more and bigger is a good idea because if you think about it, right, the limitation on someone who is incredibly active is, or active in reporting is where they go, right, and how much space they can really cover. And if you start to, it's almost like the, the LeBron James story, right? If you, if, if you sign LeBron James and you don't get anybody else worthwhile on the team, well, being the greatest basketball player in the world only gets the team so far. Because right, he can only be so many places on the court at, at one time. So if you start creating a pyramid of, of participation in such a way that you're pushing the pyramid further and further up at the top, then that, those individuals are responsible for so much more. It becomes impractical to think that they could find every streetlight outage. And yeah, stuff I hear you, but such. it would be nice to see a quantitative way of uh, Of just fine. Okay. We, we could do that. Next time you're Yeah, right. next time. All right, so we have to... <laughs> Give the room. Thanks, Don, again. Thank